want to injure the victim. Hello, my name is Matthew Steiner. Matt Steiner is a senior crime scene analyst and veteran investigator of over 22 years. Today I'm breaking down crime scene clips from movies and TV again. Decomposing body, silence of the lambs. What else do you see, Sterling? Well, he's not local. Her ears are pierced three times and there's a, a glitter nail polish. So what I did like uh, is you know, she starts describing the injuries and she does a really good job of describing a contact gunshot wound. She then describes a star shape or stellite pattern. Star shape contact entrance wound. Which is indicative of a contact wound. They also say they're gonna flip the body over to make it easier to fingerprint. She'll be easier to print when we turn her over. That's true also. It is easier to fingerprint the body if you turn the body over. If you look at the way they show the arms, they show what's called marbling. Uh, and then that's like uh, part of the decomposition process where the hemoglobin will break down inside the blood vessels. But if we have arms like she had where it was in that stage of marbling, uh, we would also see more advanced decomposition in her face. In this scene, we see that Clarice notices something that was in the photograph that they didn't see normally. She's got something in her throat. You're taking a close-up photograph of something, you'll notice more detail in that photograph than you do would with your naked eye. So this does happen. They're used to these smells. You would never see them with anything underneath their nose like that. Right. It's better just to get used to the smell. Like, you'll get used to it, and you just will forget about the smell. But if you try to mask it, occasionally you'll get a whiff that's going to break through that vapo rub, and it's going to be worse. Lord Almighty. Transient Evidence, Sherlock. In this scene, he notices some very important details about the transient nature of evidence, things that aren't permanent. Areas are wet, areas are dry, so you get to the crime scene, there's a glass on the counter and it's got ice in it. It's not gonna stay you know, in that form, it's gonna melt eventually. There's no other way to capture that than to note that, and these are all types of transient evidence that we could encounter at a crime scene. And that's what Sherlock Holmes is all about. It was all about the devil being in the details. Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock, was himself a doctor and a scientist, and was a great influence on the field of forensic science. Most notably, he influenced uh, Edmund Locard, a famous French scientist who's been considered the father of forensic science. He came up with this exchange principle that there is a contact between two things, two objects, a person and a scene, a scene and a person, and something is transferred there. And this is the basic founding principle of forensic science. We're looking for what's left behind. And this is all inspired by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Bite mark analysis, NCIS. Here's Ducky's muscle tissue scan, a little 3D magic for clarity, and I give you the killer's incisors. Yeah, this is just pure television, not reality. You wouldn't realize what you're looking at unless you're trained in that sort of software. It's not gonna come up with these fun little green boxes like this. Back in 2009, the National Academy of Sciences came out with a report about the validity of certain fields in forensic science. And one of the fields that they questioned was bite mark analysis. Teeth matching are like 100,000 to one. Your skin, uh, it's not like the molding stuff that you would see at the dentist. You know, it's not gonna leave a perfect impression. It's uneven. There's many reasons why you, you wouldn't be able to leave a perfect impression where you'd match them to someone's teeth like we see in this clip. There have been many cases where you would have two different experts, two different odontologists that don't agree on the same case. So that's why this evidence has been questioned as of late. Well, that's great, Chipper. Robot cop, Robocop. So yeah, this is like really cool technology, no longer in the not too distant future. Uh, obviously it's not gonna be like this, this is a movie, but we do use some of those types of technologies that we see there. So he's doing some sort of scanning. At crime scenes, we use a 3D laser scanner, and that's a great way to document the scene uh, the geometry of the scene, as well as taking imaging of the scene, to later on have a first-person perspective of what that scene looked like, and it's invaluable for reconstructions. You could bring a jury into that scene to show what it looked like first-person virtually. Uh, and just think about for training, you know, you have all these scenes that now are captured, and you can bring other people that weren't there to show them you know, how we investigated the scene. He then uses the camera imaging of the surveillance cameras to do photogrammetry. So the positions of the cameras 
are solved and then we could figure out the position where that car was originally. So he then takes those two types of evidence, pieces them together and has this reconstruction. Haunted house crime scene, criminal minds. The unsub might have sustained injuries. We should check local hospitals just in case. If the unsub had to disarm Kim before he could attack her, that would have been a lot more work for him. Yeah. And the only obstacle this time would have been her husband, Brad. But the unsub got the jump on him out in the hallway. And the unsub's ability. They say unsub a lot in this clip. The unsub. The unsub. The unsub. The unsub. Or did the unsub? The unsub's evolving. Unsub, I think, is unknown subject or unidentified subject. In the 22 years of working crime scenes, I've never heard another detective use that term. The unsub. Or unsub. This guy's the perfect unsub. So, you know, eventually they take a break from saying unsub and they notice these piles of salt inside of a crime scene. So sometimes we do see uh, evidence of people's supernatural beliefs and superstitions at a crime scene. Uh, I've seen piles of salt. I had a case where they had a cauldron with a human skull with liquid mercury on it. Whether a crime scene is haunted, I've never seen that. You know, I investigated over 2,000 crime scenes. Uh, most scenes where someone died of a violent nature and you yet to see a ghost or an apparition. Crime scene contamination, no country for old men. I know this truck. Belongs to a fella named Moss. I don't understand why they're riding a horse to the crime scene. It's the same tire tread coming back as going, made about the same time. Being at the distance from the height of a horse to look down, you, you could be missing things. It could be destroying serology. It could be destroying footwear impressions. It could be stepping on bullets and casings, and who knows what else. Is that Mexican brown dope? Tommy Lee should be wearing gloves. We don't want to touch evidence with bare hands, especially not narcotics. But you don't believe it? <laughs> no. Stab wound analysis, blue bloods. An attacker who's five foot ten would angle more down into the victim's sternum. The angle on Ms. Robbins is more level, indicating an attacker who's no more than five foot six. This is complete horseshit, by the way. Son of a bitch. The uh, job of the forensic pathologist is to document wound paths, but they would never postulate the height of the attacker. Five foot six. You could be crouched, you could be standing tall, you could be on the ground you know, which would all affect the way that you're wounded, whether it's going straight in or at an angle. Even her, like her demonstration on Donnie Wahlberg, she shows her, even herself, stabbing downward and stabbing straight in, you know. The person could jump up and attack them. There's so many variables here that they would never estimate a, a killer's height. But the depth of penetration is markedly less than typically associated with the upper body strength of a male. So a shorter woman. This is completely wrong. Skin is what offers the greatest resistance, not the tissue itself. Once you breach the skin, it's relatively easy to go to a, a further depth. A pathologist would never say that it was a woman over a man. They mostly are concerned with the cause and manner of death. Right. Fingerprinting, the return of the Pink Panther. I mean, obviously this is a comedy, but this is obviously not the right way to do it either. Besides the excessive amount of fingerprint powder, and then his magnifying glass failing and falling onto the evidence, and then blowing onto the evidence, introducing DNA to the evidence. It, these are all wrong things. He pulled himself across the floor. Of course, he would need a very slippery floor to do that. Therefore, the wax. The wax? Ah! I have to admit, I have fallen down at a crime scene. Uh, on several occasions, my coworkers have fallen down at crime scenes. Even though he's not wearing personal protective equipment, we do. And the bottoms of the feet on those personal protective equipments, those Tyvek suits, can be very slick and you can fall down. Are you uh, all right? Of course I am all right. I'm examining the wicks. Smelling of evidence, the closer. The guy drinks, passes out in the hot tub, his body temperature rises and his liver explodes. But this robe is soaking wet. She's smelling evidence, which is a, a good way uh, to document the transient type of evidence that will be there. Chlorine. So that smell may be gone hours later, days later. What I don't like is that she smashed her face into the towel. Uh, that's a contamination issue. This is a crime scene, y'all. And it's gross. I mean, you don't know what's on that towel to begin with. It, you know, it could have been feces, it could have been urine. And now that's all over your face. Lieutenant Flynn, could you do the honors of the mower, please? Wake someone. And she just took DNA from the towel, or that could have been on the towel, and then put that onto the toupee. So 
Uh, two no-nos right there. I need this hurry through SID in about two shakes of a lamb's tail. Shaking of the toupee uh, is a no-no. There could be DNA on there. And by you shaking it, you could be losing that. Uh, and plus, you're contaminating somebody else by them getting hit in the face, but whatever was on that toupee. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Death investigation, Sherlock. I mean, suicide is pretty common among city boys. We don't know that it was suicide. Come on. The door was locked from the inside. You had to climb down the balcony. So in this scene, we actually have a homicide that's being posed as a suicide. You've got a solution that you like, but you're choosing to ignore anything you see that doesn't comply with it. I like what Sherlock says here, that you're just taking some of the evidence and basing your theories on that and ignoring all the other evidence. So in this case, um, he uses deductive reasoning to come up with the handedness of our victim. Like? The wound's on the right side of his head. And? Van Coon was left-handed. Requires quite a bit of contortion. Left-handed? Normally, the, the easiest way to figure out the handedness of somebody is just asking, you know, the family, uh, the friends, co-workers of somebody, they would know whether he was left-handed or not. Coffee table on the left-hand side, coffee mug handle pointing to the left. We would then want to look at other evidence that could be supporting that it's a homicide, not a suicide. Some people are ambidextrous, some people have cross dominance, well, they prefer to do certain actions with certain hands. Uh, there are plenty of people that are left-handed that shoot guns with their right hand. He's also ignoring that fact. You're finally asking the right questions. Tasting evidence, bones. Hey, bones, bones, <laughs> get it? What are you doing? Yeah, yuck, you would never want to put evidence in your mouth. So you don't lick bones? Who licks bones? It's, the, it's been in Russia, it's human. Forensic anthropologist, just by looking at it, would know that it was human by its shape and by knowing what that looks like versus a dog bone, versus a chicken bone. Burned body, CSI Miami. It's got a shiny residue on it. There could be traces of hydrocarbon. Yeah, we use the mini ray to detect the hydrocarbons he left behind and find his point of origin. That's a great idea. We see them using a mini ray, uh, which is a version of the, a multi ray, which is a VOC detector to detect hydrocarbons. She's kind of waving it around like a divining rod. And that's not the proper way to use it. Uh, first off, you want to be closer to the surface that you suspect the accelerant to be on. So she has to be lower to the ground to really detect uh, anything significant. This is definitely our point of origin. I think it was an excuse for them to use some cool tech, uh, like the mini ray. But I mean, a real life crime scene, you would do a, a search. And in that search, you would have found a large burn pool in the parking lot. Illegal DNA collection, Luther. So that's a really interesting, yet very illegal way to get DNA from somebody. The fruits of the poisonous tree refers to evidence that's obtained illegally. The metaphor is that the tree being the source of the evidence, uh, if that is tainted, anything that comes from the way that you collect that evidence is also tainted, so the fruit. Most commonly, we'll get DNA from somebody through consent or a court order. Uh, another way to get DNA from somebody is through what's called an abandonment sample. Uh, this is where investigators will collect things that are discarded by a suspect. That could be a can of soda, a cigarette butt that was willingly left behind. Sometimes this takes a lot of work. Sometimes investigators have to follow somebody around for weeks at a time, waiting for them to spin on the sidewalk or to drop some trash. Even though it may be tempting to get evidence in this way, you don't want to lose that case by doing something stupid, like collecting evidence in a legal way. I know exactly what that feels like. Returning to the crime scene, Red Dragon. Where's the dog? No one heard barking. There's nothing about it in the case file. So what I really like about this is that, you know, they show a crime scene that's properly safeguarded. Even on a door, they have a door seal. That door has a broken window that they have put a piece of cardboard and secured that cardboard with evidence tape. This is what you would want to see when you went to a crime scene, especially if you went back, you want to make sure you're the one that's breaking the seal of that door to you know, make sure that there's continuity inside the crime scene, that, that if you collect evidence now, that it wasn't placed by somebody else coming into the scene afterwards. The one little misstep I see is that nothing is processed for fingerprints. That whole path of him going up the stairs, those walls would be covered with fingerprint powder. What we see here is you know, the set designer's attempt at 
creating arterial spatter on the wall. Those are like those arcing patterns that we see. They don't look very realistic, but the mechanism that's used to create them is very difficult to replicate. So I understand you know, why it doesn't look perfect. Other patterns that they got right though was those drag marks. And that's definitely important types of bloodstain patterns that we want to look at. We want to look at the direction in which those drag patterns are going. And we could tell that by the feathering of the blood as it's moving in a certain direction. Drag the bodies into the master bedroom. We see another pattern that's interesting to me on the mirror. Didn't look like they sampled those blood stains. Once it's dried, you know, we're gonna take a swab of some sort. Uh, we're gonna hydrate that swab with distilled water. And then we're gonna swab as much as that stain as possible, or at least a section of it. You would see lines through it where the person was sampling. Uh, I didn't see that here. It's possible that it did it, but I don't think so. The children were still in their beds when they were shot, which might indicate that he used a silencer. That's a possibility, but, but one of many possibilities. We see a lot of times in TVs and movies people using silencers, but in real life, we rarely see them. This is Crime Scene Theory, Fargo. You might need a little warm-up. You shouldn't drink coffee at a crime scene or any sort of beverage, really. Oh, jeez. Here's the second one. The biggest contaminant to a crime scene is the people that go into it, the investigators themselves. It's in the head and the hand there. I guess that's a defensive wound. At a scene, we may act things out, the biomechanics of the way things could happen like that or like that or like this. We got a shooting. These folks drive by. There's a high-speed pursuit ends here and then this execution type deal. She definitely came to conclusions way too quickly. Yeah. There's a lot to take in and she'd even go look at the other victim that was down the road, the, the trooper. Let's go take a look at that trooper. To figure out sequencing, you'd have to look at everything, have a, bit, a, a more detailed look at it before you would just come to a snap decision. You see something down there, chief? No, I just think I'm gonna barf. Suspect lineup. Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I heard him. He was singing along to the music at the bar. Do you remember what he was singing? I think it was that song, I Want It That Way. Backstreet Boys, I'm familiar. Number one, could you please sing the opening to I Want It That Way? Okay. You are my fire. Forensic phonetic analysis usually is involved with recorded audio evidence. Not so much this, you know, in-person audio lineup. Tell me why ain't nothing but a heartache. Most experts will say that you can't uniquely identify someone by their voice. I never want to hear you say. This is obviously for comedy purposes. Number five killed my brother. Oh my God, I forgot about that part. Fingerprint database, person of interest. Wow. What the computer's looking at is different points of identification. Wow, wow. So if you look at your fingerprints, anywhere that your lines of your fingerprint come apart, they come together, create islands, they start, they stop. These are all points of identification. Your guys' prints were found in half a dozen crime scenes over the years. And when they do have a match, you know, it could be a match to several different possibilities. What you got down there, Carter? And then the investigator themselves has to go through each one and include or exclude who it actually is. And then finally, any results, any sort of identification that's made has to be verified by someone else that's independent and objective in the case. Crime scene cleanup, The Simpsons. I've never seen an angel dust for gun swap go so wrong. Hey, a mess is a mess. Normally it would be more than one person that would be tasked to clean up the scene. All right, get some paper towels, boys. And, and to clean up and dispose of that uh, biohazardous waste, you need multiple people as well. Let me start with this filthy crime scene tape. <laughs> eating at a crime scene, NCIS. Are you eating the crime scene? Okay, first off, Mom, I'm wearing gloves. Dix, people died here. They're just in the beginning of this crime scene investigation. Uh, he may be sitting at a desk that the suspect was at. Maybe there's important evidence that's there. No, I'm wearing gloves. So even if he's Wearing gloves, and that's weird to be eating food with wearing gloves like that. Uh, I, I guess you could do it, no. but you still have that, you know, whatever that grease is from those potato chips. And they're delicious. And you're transferring it to that area that you're working in. Give me some. And again, that could be an important area that they find out later on that the suspect was at. Don't lose the whole bag. I'm... We found something. Too many people in a crime scene, hot buzz. There are way too many people inside this crime scene. 
Hello. You wouldn't answer your phone inside the scene. You don't want things from your phone to get into the scene, and you don't want things from the scene to get into your phone. Nicholas, what do you want? Well, I have something important to tell you, and I didn't want to do it over the phone. This clip shows some good things and some bad things. They're wearing not only just a Tyvek suit and gloves, they have masks on, they have eye protection on. Then Simon Pegg goes into the scene, he's not wearing anything. They probably would not have allowed Simon Pegg to enter that scene without wearing personal protective equipment. Janine, I've been transferred. I'm moving away for a while. Well, I'm not Janine. <clears throat> Taking money from a crime scene, training day. <laughs> That's a quarter million dollars you're holding right there in your hand. Buy your wife a minivan with that, put the kids through college. Give me that back. Uh, you know, the only checks I cash say uh, LAPD on them, right? What's <laughs> the <laughs> matter? You don't want a piece of this? Huh? Well, I... No. Right? I'm with Ethan Hawke on this one. It's not worth it. You know, it's not worth throwing your life away. No one wants to go to jail. No. No? Large sums of money found at a crime scene. It has to be documented, and usually it's in the presence of some sort of supervision. First time, you're not comfortable. I'll hold it for you. In police departments, there are usually some sort of entity that does internal investigations, and part of that is doing integrity testing as well. Don't touch a thing. Evidence. Testing a theory, Ace Ventura, pet detective. May I tell you what I think happened? Alrighty then. Roger Pedactor went out after work. He had a few drinks and he came home, but he wasn't alone. So there's way too many people here. Uh, when you establish a crime scene, uh, you maintain what's called a crime scene log. Uh, and it tracks everyone that comes into that scene, everyone that leaves that scene, and unfortunately that includes pet detectives. This woman is Roger Pedactor's neighbor. She lives across the hall. She said she heard a scream. Is that right, ma'am? Right. And even if it was a witness that was inside the scene at the time, we want to remove them from the scene. And you said you had to open the balcony door when you keyed into the room? That's true. He would have been brought to a police facility for an interview. What's the point, Ventura? In this case, the neighbor hears something, and then Ace comes up with a theory as to the position of the door during the time of the event. There's no way that neighbor could have heard Pedactor scream on the way down with that door shut. And then relating that to someone coming afterwards and saying that the door was shut, disproving that it was a suicide. The scream she heard came from inside this apartment before he was thrown over the balcony and the murderer closed the door before he left. But we would record that. <laughs> and it would probably be a little more professional than singing and screaming and opening a door, uh, open and shut. Yes! Yes! Prince and Snow, Wind River. Why would a teenage girl be out here? I only know what the tracks say. Okay, well, that's all we got. Well, come here, I'll show you. See this one? See how the toes turned out? Footwear is probably one of the most overlooked types of evidence at a crime scene. The interpretation that, that Jeremy Renner does here uh, is he's looking at, first off, the orientation of the shoe wear impressions, and he's interpreting, first off, the direction, and that's very simple by looking at the way that the heel and toe are oriented. And then he's interpreting, which sometimes could be a little more harder to discern is that she was running. The front is much deeper than the back. It says she's running. So this is kind of questionable, you know, to say that exactly she was running. If you're carrying something, that also would change the depth of your shoe wear impressions. And that also could do with the density of the snow. She ran until she dropped here. See the pool of blood. But you would have to look at multiple shoe wear impressions. First off, it's got to be photographed. We'd coat it with several layers of snow print wax. This is an aerosolized wax that will spray on snow that has impressions on it. And normally that even gives us some more contrast, so we may photograph it again. Uh, and then the last step is to cast it by using some sort of impression casting material. Dead body in a freezer, Goodfellas. Yeah, I've had cases where, you know, it was mafia hits. It's funny how sometimes it, it, it's like cliche, you know, the, the victim was wearing a tracksuit and, you know, looks just exactly like he would on TV. He was frozen so stiff it took them two days to thaw him out for the autopsy. Frankie Carbone would take two days to thaw out before autopsy. Is it unusual? Uh, it may even take up to a week depending on how they thaw out the body. We've also seen criminals that use this to hide the time of death. So one that I can think of offhand is Richard Kuklinski, who was nicknamed the Iceman Killer. Uh, he would store his dead bodies, the people that he killed, that he murdered, that he assassinated, in an industrial freezer, and then dump them at later periods of time in different areas. 
to confuse the police as to the time of death. So having bodies frozen solid uh, isn't rare. Actually, it happens quite a bit in the colder states here in America. Another hair analysis scene, Castle. Long blonde hair. Well, this could have come from one of the women at the bachelorette party. That's what I thought until I had it tested. Came back positive for testosterone and anabolic steroids. Your blondie is a man. Couldn't it be that it's a woman that's taking testosterone and anabolic steroids and that would show up in her hair? At one time, they would analyze hair and they would say uh, gender, they would say race, uh, they would even match a, a hair from a crime scene to a suspect. Today, uh, they no longer do those things. They'll take a hair and they'll analyze it for suitability for DNA. Other things they could tell about a hair is whether it's chemically treated, whether it was burned, uh, how it was removed, the stage of development that hair is in, the somatic origin of that hair, whether it came from your head, from your eyelash, from your pubic hair. Uh, those are things they can tell, but not whether it's a man or a woman. So the public's perception on what forensics is and what crime scene investigators do is often built on these types of shows. This attention that the public now has, this fascination that they have with true crime and, and with cr crime scene type of shows is good because when people go and they testify to cases, they have a touchstone. They, have, they know something about this, this sort of evidence because they like these shows. I don't expect Hollywood to always get it right, but it's interesting to see it when they get it wrong. If you're enjoying Technique Critiques, subscribe to Wired.